God. Father, we pray that the body of Christ will grow even stronger, my Father. Even in these difficult times, unique moments in history, but Father, we know the church of the Lord is growing stronger. For the Holy Bible says, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it is true, the church of God is moving on. Yes, she is moving on, she's getting stronger and stronger. In spite and despite of the lockdowns and restrictions here and there, the church is growing strong. And so I pray for all believers around the world that they will remain strong, they will remain faithful, they will remain true to Christ, my Father. Oh, we bless you, Jehovah, because you are good. You are welcome, Jehovah God even as we continue. We love you and we bless you today. For it is in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen and amen. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, last, last time, last week, we, we continued to conclude some facts about um, the rapture. We talked about quite a number of things. In fact, we, we, we talked about uh, what we will be doing, you know, once we are raptured, all right, and we meet Christ in the air, you know, what will we be doing there, you know, what will be happening up there, you know, so that's what we looked about last week, and we said very clearly that uh, once we are raptured, oh, we are all invited at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is where we will receive rewards. Everyone, each one of us, we will receive rewards in accordance to what we have done, in accordance to our works. In other words, how we live our lives as Christians counts a lot. It really matters a lot. How we do ministry, how we relate with people, how we, I mean, how we do business as Christians, you know, how we raise our children as Christians, how we relate as, as, as spouse. I mean, everything encompassing our lives as Christian actually counts a lot. And so it is important, friends, to remain true and faithful as Christians. You know, Jesus said, in this world we will meet many troubles, but we need to take heart because Jesus himself overcame. And so we will meet those challenges, but we must remain true because everything will be judged you know, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. How we are building as Christians, it will really count a lot, my friend. So don't take opportunities that God gives you as a Christian for granted. Because nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens coincidentally. Everything is calculated and planned for. So every a uh, situation, every event, every opportunity that you find in life. The Bible says, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. The reason is, everything will be judged. The Apostle Paul says that uh, for those that uh, their, 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 their work will be burned, will be destroyed, then uh, they will receive no crown. But actually, they will be saved. Their souls will be saved. Let me read that one. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 14, I say, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because that day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, 
the builder will receive a reward. I repeat that one. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping from the flames. You understand now? So everything we do, whether in public or private, whether in the full light or in darkness, as Christians, it will actually be revealed that day. How you live your life today will be revealed that day because each and everyone's work will be tested, will be tested. So I will also read Revelation 19, 6 and 9. We, re we read this last week. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true sayings of God. These are true sayings of God. So blessed is the man who is invited at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And actually, the rapture will usher us into the presence of Jesus Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, all the other things I've shared will actually take place there. You see, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will know our labor in the Lord is worthwhile when he says, well done. So his invitation to enter into the joy of your Lord will cause our hearts actually to sing hallelujah. So the hope of the rapture is an anchor for our souls during the storms of life. The hope is like a guiding star. May our eyes always behold this star of hope until the bright morning star, Jesus Christ, appears. Until Christ returns, let us keep looking up. Now, I want us to answer the second question. Remember the second part, what will be happening on earth and those who will have missed out on the rapture. Now, this is our concentration. I said many things last week. I read several scriptures. I won't read them today, but I, I'm just doing a recap. Now, immediately following the rapture, there will be great trouble in the earth. Such has never happened since the beginning of nations. There will exist great confusion, desperations, frustrations, blame games, betrayal, suspicions, and this will actually lead into wars in the world. I also mentioned some organization that, organizations that will also play a very critical role in the revelation, in the introduction of the Antichrist. I mentioned organizations like the UN, the United Nations, World Health Organization, you know, even what they call uh, uh, the World Economical Forum, yeah, World, Health, uh, World Food Organization, IMF, World Bank, you know, they will play a very critical role in the in the acceptance, in the acceptance, in the general, the global acceptance of the Antichrist into the world. And I'm telling you, any nation that will dare resist this organization together with the Antichrist will actually pressure and sanction such nations. They will put political sanction, 
socio-economical, military, you know, until every nation actually comply. If you look at uh, developing countries, you know, like Kenya, for example, we have huge debts to Nadaiwa Pesa Mingi Sana. Kiasiakua, if China today says that uh, Kenya must take the vaccine, for example, in order for us to cancel their six trillion debts, you know, the government of Kenya will actually accept that offer very quickly. So during that time, things will be similar. It will be actually like that. You will be put under economical pressure that you cannot survive unless you accept the mark, you accept, you accept the Antichrist and his program. So things will not be very good here on earth. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress. Such has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, these are Israelites, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered will be delivered. Now, to clearly understand the tribulation or the great tribulation, we must first familiarize ourselves with some prophetic narratives from the book of Daniel and Revelation. Now, we will actually major so much in the, on these two books to understand this anytime events. We will first examine what actually we call uh, the prophetic lines. This is what I want to bring to you because it is important. These prophetic lines, here we refer to how God has been dealing with different uh, people that lived in different times in history. In other words, we mean people that lived in different historical dispensations. God has been dealing with them differently. And uh, I want us to understand them today, to, to lay a foundation on the things that actually are coming. So the first thing, the first line that we need to look at is what we call the world and kingdoms. The world and kingdoms. The world and kingdoms. Now. The world and kingdoms are actually covered in, uh, in these two books, but majorly in the book of Daniel. And that is where I want us to dwell so much right now. If you go to Daniel chapter 2, beginning from verse number 24 on the way to 45, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. All right? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And this dream actually terrified him. The dream terrified him. It left him almost like um, a dead man, you know? So I want us to read, we will read these ones from uh, our Bibles. I want us to take time and read. I want us to read slowly, slowly. Let, we will not be in a hurry. I want us to move very slowly so that we can be able to to understand these things. So Daniel, we are reading Daniel chapter 2. Now, when, Dan, when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar saw this dream, it really terrified him to, to, to his core. And so he called all the wise men in his kingdom, the magicians, the astrologers, all these guys, the scientists, so that they can be able to interpret the dream, you know? So he told them, tell me the dream and then interpret it for me. And these guys could not. They could not interpret the dream. And so the king was so furious, so furious indeed, that uh, he actually wanted them killed. But before that, in verse 24, then Daniel went to Arioch, 
whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. So Ariot took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a, a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel also called Belshazzar, Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has known, he has known King Nebuchadnezzar. What, I mean, sorry, he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Now, that's important. I want you to take note of that because it is very important. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and visions that pass through your mind as you are lying in bed are this. As your majesty was lying, there your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked and there before you stood as a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you are watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet. Now I want you to take note that the statue was hit at its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Wow. It filled the whole earth. Now, this is extremely important for you to understand. Now, let me quickly help you understand a few things. Very quickly. Now, that statue that Nebuchadnezzar actually saw in his vision, it represented the kingdoms that were to come after Nebuchadnezzar. So, the golden head of that statue actually represents Babylon. It represents Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar himself. That was the statue, and that was the first kingdom. It was a very powerful kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. And we know that which followed was a silver chest. The statue had a silver chest. Now, that silver chest represents the Medes and the Persians kingdom that, of course, will be ruled by Darius and Sarius Cyrus respectively. And then it had a, a bronze waist to the thighs. So the waist and the thighs were made of bronze. Okay, this represents Greece. Greece, the kingdom of Greece. And of course, under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And we will come back to these things. And then the iron legs, the iron legs represents Rome, the Romans. Huh? It represents the Romans. You understand the, 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 
the rule of the Romans was a ruthless one. It was actually like an iron fist. If you study church history, you will understand. No wonder when, uh, when Jesus Christ was born, the Jews, Palestine, was actually colonized by the Romans. And uh, they were so ruthless that the Jews, they were longing for the coming of the Messiah to redeem them, to deliver them from this iron fist kind of a government. So the iron legs represent the kingdom of Rome. And then the iron and the clay feet. You know, the feet were made of, uh, the feet were made of iron and clay, a mixture of iron and clay. So you and I know very well that when you mix iron and clay, all right, they are not very much compatible. They can actually coexist, but it will be a very weak kind of a mixture. You understand? And that is exactly what it is. This represents 10 kings or 10 kingdoms, but to summarize this part, these are mixed, we call them mixed kingdoms. Some of them are strong and others are weak kingdoms. Now, this is the last kingdom that we are in today. So we are living in this last kingdom whereby we have nations that are stronger and others are very weak, but they live together. You, I want you, they have their own sovereignty. Just imagine Kenya, for example, in comparison maybe to the United States of America, or Madagascar in comparison to China. You know, though we have independence, you know, we exercise some, 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 form, of, uh, some form of sovereignty, but in comparison, with these other nations, my friend, we are, we are clay. So we are clay, they are iron, but we are living together. Now, this is the last end. This is the last line. Now, I want to make a statement here that all these prophetic lines that we are going to mention, there are only three, they will all end. They will all culminate. They will all connect at the end. They will all connect at the end. Now, that's important to note. They will all connect at the end. There will be one point they will all converge at the end. So, when we look at kingdoms and the world, so, so much kingdoms have come. They have come, they have come. Until now, we are in the last kingdoms. Now, I want you to take notice that the stone hit the feet and the clay. The feet that was made of iron and clay. Now, that is the last kingdom. That is the kingdom that is surviving now. And these are the nations of the world, the kingdoms of the world. And that is where there will be a war. Now, I will come back to that later on. But I want you to note that the stone hit at that place. Yeah? When Jesus Christ will come now so that to establish his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, this is what he will hit. These are the kings and the nations that he will hit and he will crush them. And then he will establish his kingdom that will fill the entire earth. You understand now? So let's move. There is another dream. Now this is Daniel's vision. In chapter, in chapter 7, in Daniel chapter 7, there is a dream that Daniel had. It's a vision that Daniel had. And I want us to read briefly from verse 1 to 8. He says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now, Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. So when the father died, his son, Belshazzar, took over the kingdom. So in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. All right? 
Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven shining up the great sea. Now, I want you to be careful. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were, were, were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of uh, its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And uh, on its back, it had four wings, like those of a bird. Mm -hmm. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and it trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had the eyes like the eye of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully as I looked. Thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. All right, let, let's just stop there at verse, uh, verse eight. Let's stop there at verse eight. Now, this vision, this dream, this vision that Daniel had of the four beasts, by the way, it is not different from what Nebuchadnezzar actually saw. That the vision is just the same as what Nebuchadnezzar saw. So the lion here represents Babylon. The bear still represents the Mendes and the Persians. The leopard is Greece. And the dreadful creature is, is Rome and represents the Romans. All right. Now I want us to read again Daniel chapter 9. There is a, I mean Daniel chapter 8. There is another dream, but this one is important dream. This is very important dream, man. Eh? It's a very important vision that I want us to read. And then I will explain to you some serious things there. Daniel had a dream, a vision of a ram and a goat. A ram and a god. So in the third year of Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside Ulai Canal. I looked up and there before me was a ram with two horns. Now, I want you to note that. A ram with two horns standing beside the canal and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but it grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and it became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a god with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came towards the two-horned ram. Oh, I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it in great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The god knocked it to the ground and trampled on it 
and none could rescue the ram from its power. The God became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off. Take note of that. The large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. Now, out of the one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of heaven, and it threw some of the stunning hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifices from the Lord and his sanctuary was thrown down because of rebellion. <clears throat> the Lord's people and the daily sacrifices were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did and the truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to him, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifices, the rebellion that, that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, it will take 2,000 300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. The sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Now, if you need the interpretation of that dream, is that what follows? So I want you to go read all the way to 27 for the interpretation, but allow me to give you the interpretation here already. So I will be quickly to tell you now what those things represent. For example, the ram with two horns. There are actually two kings. All right? There are two kings. And these are the, Medi, the Median and the Persian king. That is Darius and King Silas. That is the ram with two horns. So the ram represents Greece. I mean, and I mean represents the Medes and the Persian. And the two horns represents these two kings. That is the Medi, the Median, Median, Median. Darius was the king for the Median. He came from the Medians and then Cyrus from Persians. So the male god is the kingdom of Greece. The male god is the kingdom of Greece. Its large horn is the first king. Their first king is Alexander the Great. Now, if you study history, if you study history, Actually, historians, they place Alexander the Great as one of the greatest conquerors of all time. Because during his tenure, he managed to conquer all the known world, almost the whole world, almost the whole world. And uh, <laughs> his reign was very, he was short-lived. He actually ruled in almost 13 years only. But the guy was so powerful. He was so great. I'm telling you, he was so great. This man was so powerful. He conquered the whole world. In fact, today, even the Bible itself is written in Greek. You know, you've heard preachers many times say this word in Greek means this. In Greek means this. This is the Greek word that means this. Because this man was so powerful. He, he, he had a policy. He's actually famous with this policy of Hellenization. Hellenization, Hellenization. Forcing the Jews to adapt Greek culture. Not only the Jews, but everywhere he conquered. He introduces the, Jew, the Greek culture. The Greek way of life. He introduced the Greek language. By the way, this includes even the worship of Zeus, the principal Greek god. So within a very short time, the known world was actually speaking Greek. The culture was Greek. Yeah, Even Jews, some of them were Hellenized. 
They became the <laughs> They were Hellenized Jews. So this guy was very powerful. Unfortunately, he died at the age of 33 years. He died. He died at the age of 33 years. Please, someone unmute your microphone. Unmute your microphone, please, to allow us to have a wonderful service. All right. Now, the broken horn, the broken horn signifies the death of Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great died in uh, 323 BC. So when he died, the four horns that grew after the large horn was broken are actually four kingdoms. There are four Greek kingdoms that were ruled by four of Alexander's generals after his death. So those four horns that grew after the, the, this long, strong horn was broken are actually four different kings because his kingdom, when Alexander actually died, his kingdom was divided into four. And each kingdom was ruled by one of his generals. There is actually a prophecy somewhere, probably we'll read it, that actually indicates that the kingdom, after Alexander dies, his kingdom will not go to any of his family members, but it will be given to other people. And that is exactly what happened. It was given to four of his generals. In fact, I have his names. The first one was called... Uh, Polemusota, Polemisota. If you have read history, you must have met Polemisota. The other one was uh, Lismacus. The third one is Cassandra. And finally, Selenus. These were the four generals that succeeded Alexander the Great. And of course, the kingdom was divided into four parts. And then we had four kingdoms. These are the four horns that grew after the large horn was broken. Now, time went by, several things happened in between other kings came that they are not very significant. But the fierce and sinister king that will rise later is actually a Seleucid king by the name of Antichus Epiphanes IV, who is actually a type of the Antichrist. Now, this is important. I give you this information because you will see these things in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. So if you have the foundation, you will be able to interpret those prophecies correctly. So he was very sinister king, Antichus Epiphanes IV. He was very powerful also, but he ruled with deceit. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's a type of the Antichrist. In 167 BCE, BCE, he deposed two Jewish high priests who resisted his policy of imposing Greek culture on the people. As a result, riots ensued in Jerusalem. And in response, Antichus, after crushing the rebellion, he outlawed, now watch this, he outlawed Judaism in Judah. He made Judah, I mean the religion of the Israelites, I, 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 I mean uh, he criminalized the worship of Yahweh. You know, he criminalized the worship of Yahweh. So he outlawed Judaism. No one was supposed to, to acknowledge Yahweh, to worship Yahweh in Judah. He went further. He did this by prohibiting circumcision. You know, he prohibited no more circumcision. And remember, God had asked Abraham to do this to all his descendants as a mark, you know, as a, as a covenant mark that they belong to him. Now here, Antichus Epiphanes is prohibiting them from practicing their religion and their faith. 
He also burned copies of the Torah. That is the Hebrew Bible. And he also forbid Sabbath worship. People were no longer allowed to worship on Sabbath. So it's like telling people not to go to church on Sunday in our day. <clears throat> in fact, coronavirus <laughs> has tried to do something. By the way, I will tell you something, my friends. I am not a prophet, neither am I a son of a prophet. But whatever has happened with the coronavirus thing is just but a hassle. It is a test. They are testing the waters. They are actually testing the waters. How they can be able to launch the antichrist programs in the world. So they are trying to test the waters. Is it possible? And in truly speaking, they have managed to do quite a number of things. To me, that they are aligning very, I mean, they, 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 they are aligning themselves correctly with biblical prophecies. So coronavirus, the fact that you're not going to church now, you cannot be able to meet with people, the fact that you cannot be able to, I mean, you have to maintain social distancing whenever you're, all these things I'm telling you, they're just but a preparation. The issues of vaccine, meaning all these are preparations of the Antichrist. I had people who are saying, oh, you know, you need to give a vaccine, and anybody that will not have the vaccine, they're not allowed to do trade because they are dangerous to the world. That is exactly the narrative they will always push. That's the narrative they will push. I've already heard that uh, they are saying that they will sanction uh, uh, Magufuli, you know, the world will sanction him. Why would they do that? And yet Magufuli has a sovereignty in Tanzania. Tanzania is a sovereign nation, you know? But they will put pressure on him because he did not fully comply with their plan. That is exactly what will happen, brothers and sisters. But not only that he did that, he went ahead and he sacrificed a pig to Zeus on the holy altar in the Jerusalem temple. Now, this is what it is called the abomination that causes desolation that was spoken in Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27. Actually, Antichus, when he did this, when he sacrificed the pig, on the holy altar of God, that was his downfall. That was actually his downfall. Because the Jews revolted, resisted him. And that is exactly what will happen with the Antichrist. Now, that's why I said Antichrist Epiphanes IV is a type of the Antichrist because that is exactly what the Antichrist will also do. He will not sacrifice a pig, but he will erect his own image at the Holy of Holies, something like what Nebuchadnezzar did. And then he will demand worship. He will demand everyone to worship him. At that point, now the Israelites will change their minds. Now, let's move to the second line. I am done with the kingdoms and the nations. We will meet with them at the end when the stone will hit them. That's where we will meet them. But now let's talk about Gentiles and the church. The second line is the Gentiles and the church. The Gentiles and the church. Now I want you to understand about the Gentiles and the church. It's, uh, it's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now, this is what I want you to understand. That the seven churches of Asia Minor represents different epochs, or you can call different era, different eras. I'm a different dispensation in church history. The last epoch is the Laodicean church. You remember? The lukewarm church. All right? That's the last epoch. That's the last, hey, that is the last church. And that is where we are living in. Now, in the world and kingdoms, we saw the feet, the mixture of clay and, 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 and iron as the last kingdom. Here, the last kingdom, the last, the last, the last period 
The last epoch is the lukewarm church, the modern church, if you want. And that is where we are today. That is the last stage that we are. Very quickly, this one I'll just be very quickly. I want to show you some of the periods. The first period of the church is what we call the apostolic church. All right? This is, it started in 33 AD on the day of Pentecost when the church was officially born. You remember very well when Peter preached a sermon and 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. The apostolic period is characterized with charisma. You know, charisma, it was led by the apostle. You know, everybody was a candidate and they preached the gospel. You know, it had their leaders as Peter, Paul, James, and Barnabas. And then we move to the next stage, which is actually the next church. We have uh, the persecuted church. This is another epoch. This is another period of church history. And, uh, you know, you remember the death of, the death of Stephen, you remember those people that died, that kind of persecution. But it goes all the way to 100 AD. You know, it continues from there and it goes on and it goes on until the death of Saint John, John the Revelator. He died in 100 AD. You know, that's where he died. That's when he died. And uh, persecution, it was actually a state, it was called a state persecution. It was the state that was carrying out the persecution of the church. The church was persecuted, my friends. People were cut into pieces using a hacksaw. You know, you are cut into two pieces using a hacksaw and they will not recant their faith. They will not deny Jesus. Some were given into wild beasts. They were eaten, they were torn apart by lion, hungry lions, but they would rather be eaten than to deny Jesus. Some of these people, actually I'm told some of the emperors, the Roman emperors, you know, this period Yote, was carried out during the Roman Empire, the empire, the Roman Empire, the church period. They did a lot of trouble. They would go to their garden and have their dinner in a garden, a garden dinner. And then they will post some Christians and tie them around and pour them some oil and light them up. And then the Christians become the lighting of that garden while these guys were just enjoying their meals. But still these people will not recant their faith. They endured hardship and they would not recant their faith. I want you to ask yourself, my friend, I have seen nowadays in the era that we are living in, when a Christian go through a small problem, they will not go to church already. They can't go to church. I have been quasward. My friend, what are you talking about? There are people that have endured hardship they would not deny Christ. I am telling you, friends, let's stop jokes in our era. We are living in the lukewarm church, the modern church, the easy, and they want things easy, easy, easy. People went through suffering. The other church history period, by the way, the persecuted period, you can even see the church of Simrina represented there. Then we have the imperial church in 33, in 313 AD. Now, <laughs> the imperial church, something happened in the church. Very dramatic. There is an emperor by the name of Constantine. Constantine, <laughs> he made an edict. He wrote a letter that changed the situation of the church. Completely, the church became the darling of the nation. Because Emperor Constantina, when he was preparing to go for war, he claims that he saw a vision in the sky of the cross. 
So when he saw the cross, he was told, by this you conquer. So he believed that actually what he did, he changed his army. All the uniforms of his army, they had the, the sign of the cross at their shoulders, you know. So they went and fought in the name of the Lord. And actually, coincidentally, they won the battle. And from that time, he, he, he interpreted that to mean that uh, he, he needed to become a Christian. So actually, he treated the church so kindly. He wrote a letter in the Edict of Toleration. So the church was tolerated. As uh, soon before you know it, the church and the state actually became one. Bishops were actually being paid by the state. You know, pastors were on the church that the state payroll. They were being paid highly as ministers. They were exempted from tax. I mean, all of a sudden, the circumstance of the church, the church just changed. It was actually like a... Uh, it was like it was a situation like uh, moving from prison to palace. Yes, it was something like that. From prison to palace. So all of a sudden things became so good for the church. I mean, persecution ended, church and state were married together. That was the beginning of bad things to the church. That was the beginning of darkness in the church. That was the beginning. So, my friends, as Christians, when we want things to be good, we want the state to treat us right. We want this, we want that as Christians, we want our right, that and that right and that, that right. When all these good things happen to us, we are most likely Degenerating, we are most likely to degenerate in our faith. So that is exactly what happened when the church and the state became one. The church was elevated, it became the state religion, and everything was good. That was the imperial church. And then we move to the medieval church in 476 AD. This happened during the fall of Rome, and uh, several things happen here now. Monasticism, crusades, the rise of papal power, Sikhism and division. I mean, there were so many things that arose during this time. There were a lot. Of, you know the crusades. You know the crusades. People fighting, you know, in the name of the Lord. You know, they wanted to, I mean, people did terrible things during this period. Actually, the church did a terrible thing during this time. When a Muslim hear the word crusade, I know today we use the word crusade differently. We mean going out and preaching the gospel. No, that's not the original meaning of that word. It meant war, actually killing for Jesus because they wanted to, to, to deliver Jerusalem, you know, the Middle East. They wanted Jerusalem to, to capture Jerusalem from, from, from Muslims, the Mohammedans, Mohammedans. So it was a terrible war. They really fought a blood war. And uh, then now division started coming in the church so badly. Now, divisions and divisions, divisions and divisions. And then we come to the next era that we call the Reformed Church. The Reformed Church from 1453 AD. You know, many things happened there. The Reformation, you remember, you know, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and all those guys, eh? Uh, those times. And then let me finish by the modern church. This is where we are. It began from 1648 going forward all the way to where we are today. Maybe I was talking with someone, I was asking whether we should add another period there and call it the postmodern period of the church. I don't know, but that modern church begins from there until where we are today. And if you notice carefully, Revelation 3, verse 14 to 23, this is the last stage, and this is what it says. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea's right, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, mm, 
and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and with white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we are in the last church. We are in the last dispensation. We are the people that are living at the age of the time. You know, the present church is a rich church, make no mistake. The present church is a rich church. And because of her richness, sometimes she thinks that she is rich and she needs nothing. That's why you see a lot of things that are happening in the church. People will use even witchcraft to become rich in the church. I call it spiritual witchcraft. It is happening in the church today. That is a bad sign. This is the lukewarm church. People are neither cold nor hot. People are stealing and they are still in the church. They lift their hands and they worship the Lord. This did not happen in the apostolic church. You steal and you go to church, you collapse and die right there. But during our time, people fornicate and they come to church. You know? They rob and they come to church. They lie and they still come to church. Someone beat his wife and he comes to church and he lifts his hands and he worships and he has no problem. The lukewarm church is in great danger of to be, to be spit out. I want you to notice this. Jesus, this is his church. Yet he stands at the door and is knocking to enter into his own church. What is church doing there? What is he doing minus Jesus? Why is Jesus outside the church? Yet they are continually worshiping the Lord, glorifying the Lord, and God is not in there. What are they doing? What are we doing? Listen, he's saying, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent, modern church. Repent. 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 All right. Now, I want us to, to go to the final, the final line. There are only three. Please, let's do the final one. I know our time is spent, but let's do the final one, and then we conclude, and then we pick it up from there. Now, the final prophetic line is very significant. Israel and Jerusalem. Israel and Jerusalem is the third prophetic line. And I want us to read Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Now, this is very important. I will read it very slowly because it is very important. It forms the basis of what we'll be sharing down there. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. It says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill. Verse 21. What did I do? Okay, let me continue. While I was speaking and praying, all right, all right, confessing my sins and the sins of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, 
I'm sorry, I started up there. Let's go to verse 21. Verse 21 says, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Verse 22. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Now verse 24. Take note, please. This is very important. 77. 77. I want you to look at the word seven. It is written with an S. It is in the plurals. 77 are decreed for your people and your city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for the wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens, all right? Seven singular, sevens plural. So there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Verse 26. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. Some other version says the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. Look at verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. One seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Hallelujah. Now, we need to define a few terms very quickly here so that uh, we, we, we understand each other. Now, one week, remember we have talked about the weeks. So one week represents seven years. One week represents seven years. The anointed one is Christ Jesus. The ruler is the antichrist or the beast. The false prophet is the one, the, the, apostate, the apostate church. The apostate church or the world, the one world religion. And the dragon is Satan. Now, these times you will meet them. And I want you to take note of that. One week represents seven years. Anointed one, Christ Jesus. The ruler is the Antichrist or the beast. The false prophet is the apostate church or the one world religion. We will see it very late. Dragon is Satan. Now, the last week, now, Daniel is talking to his people. His prophecies refer to Israel. They are referring to Israel. So everything that Daniel saw, by the way, we will read, he saw things that went all the way to the very end. Because lastly, he says some will be resurrected. Others will go to, 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 to heaven and others will go to eternal damnation and shame. 
So he saw all the way to the very end for the judgment of sinners. But there is something that Daniel did not see, and I want to show you. So he says something very interesting here. I wish I could actually we could be in church because I could show this graphically because I must. This one requires actual graphics to show it graphically so that you can see it correctly. But if you read the verse carefully, he says that uh, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler will come. There will be seven, seven. So that is seven times seven. Now remember, <laughs> So, okay, let me make it short. That's about 49 years. And then he talks of 62, 62 sevens. 62 sevens, that is 62 times seven, 434 years. And then from there, he talks of until, until the anointed one. Now, the anointed one here is Jesus. Now, there is something that Daniel did not see after the anointed one has been born and be cut off. Daniel didn't see something there. But that part that Daniel did not see is actually covered by John the Revelator. Now, let me help you something. Understanding prophecies, sometimes actually we have to take it piece by piece and fix the pieces fit the pieces together to get the whole. So Daniel saw something that John did not see the past, but he saw the church period. And that is the grace period that we put after Jesus Christ died. The grace period comes in. Now Daniel did not see that. So, after the rapture, because if you read carefully, when he says the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing, all right, then he doesn't, John, Daniel does not give us the grace period. He goes ahead to bring in the ruler, the Antichrist, all right? He goes ahead and bring the Antichrist. But there is a whole period there of about seven, no, I don't know even know the, the amount of years that it, it took between the, 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 the coming of Jesus all the way to the rapture. I don't know how many years are there, but there's a very long period there, a very long historical period. But we can be able to calculate it if we follow the, the historical epochs, the, 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 yes, the church, the church history epochs. We can calculate the years, but they are not interesting. I'm not interested in the years. But that period of the church, once the church now is out of place, once the church is raptured, immediately the church is raptured, now Daniel comes in again with the one week. There is a one week, if you read in verse uh, 27. He says he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That's one week. In the middle of the seven, remember one week is in seven years, eh? In the middle of the seven, he will put to an end to sacrifice and offerings. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed upon on him. That's the Antichrist. Now, so let's, let's continue. So the last week of Daniel's visions begins immediately after the rapture of the church, which will mark the end of the church period. And now God will turn his attention to the nation of Israel. Very important, ladies and gentlemen. You see, we have already read Daniel 9.27, that he will confirm a covenant with many. He will sign a treaty with many. This actually refers to the nation of Israel. Now we are talking, God is concentrating now with the nation of Israel. The church is now out of place. The, I mean, it's out of the picture. The grace period has been lifted now. The church is up there. Now, we are in the world. What remains after the church has gone? What remains here? Now, this is what will happen to them. The Antichrist will be revealed. Yeah? Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Concerning the coming of 
our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching alleged from us, whether by prophet or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, now listen, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Now this is the Antichrist. He's a guy who has a huge talk. He can speak trash. He can actually speak against God. He can trash anything called God. He dread anything called God. He has no respect for anything sacred. This guy, verse 5 says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Now, it's important to know the Antichrist is being held back yeah, until his right time. You understand? For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. The secret power of the Antichrist is already in the world. It is already working secretly. The things that are happening in the world today, it is a preparation for the revelation of the Antichrist. But his operations are already in the world. He is working. He has his agents everywhere in the world. They even determine who becomes the president of different nations so that they can, they can fulfill their agendas. My friends, open your eyes. Open your eyes. We are living in the last days. He says, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Now, the Holy Spirit is actually holding the Antichrist for the sake of the church. But the day the church will be lifted, the Spirit of the Lord will move with the church. Then down here, the Antichrist will fully be revealed. But as it is right now, he's setting up the infrastructure. He's putting up institutions. He's laying institutions in readiness for his full revelation. I am telling you the earth will be a dreadful place to live during that time. The earth will be a terrible place, ladies and gentlemen, to live. Oh, he goes on and saying verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Now I will tell you this, when that time comes, when now we, we have done, we are done with our celebration up there. Now Jesus is coming down to establish his kingdom here on earth, the millennium kingdom. We will look at it. The nations of the world, organized by the Antichrist, will resist the coming of the Lord. And by his breath, the Bible says he will slay many. That is the time when the Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire and Satan will be bound and be put into prison. We will come to that. But I just wanted to bring this here because it's and then hey, Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy the splendor of his coming. Now, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Now, I want you to notice that. <coughs> The coming of the Antichrist will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. I have already said that the spirit of the Antichrist is with us. Haven't you seen miracles, fake miracles? They use satanic powers to perform some miracles that do not last, just to attract and deceive the masses. This is what will happen during that time. 
the, they will do wonders that serve the life. The aim is to deceive. No wonder the Bible says, brethren, test every spirit. Test every spirit to know whether it is of God. Because there are so many anti-class that have come into the world. I will show you this. I will show you this. Verse 10 says, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Mm. What does Romans say in Romans 1, verse 18? The wrath of God has been revealed for those who suppress the truth <laughs> and love the lie. They will be destroyed. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now, I will show you something. During the reign of the Antichrist, I'm telling you, evil will increase in great measure. There will be invasion of wickedness such has never been seen before. Today, I know they sell even sex online. You know, pornography. This was the Babylonian kingdom. You remember the, 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 in, 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 in Revelation, we will see this one. The harlot. Hmm? That harlot that uh, intoxicates the world with its fornications. Adultery. These things are already happening in the world, I'm telling you. But Jesus, you know, the Bible says they will be given a spirit of the, the, the lesia, a spirit of deception so that they can continue to believe a lie and then they will be destroyed. So when the Antichrist is revealed with cunning and treachery, he will sign a treaty with Israel. Now, I want you to note that Daniel 9.27 says, he will confirm a covenant with many. By the way, this refers to Israel. He will sign a treaty with Israel. He will order the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple in its original boundaries as it was in the old. He will also bring a temporal peace in the Middle East. And he will be a darling of many, especially the Israelites. The Jews will admire this guy. In fact, the Jews will look unto him as the long-promised Messiah. The Bible says he will deceive many. So especially when it touches on the temple, when he, he brings peace in Israel and rebuilds the temple, the Israelites will say, this is the Messiah. This is the promised Messiah. And they will believe in him. However, after the three and a half years, after three and a half years, you remember Daniel 9.27 says, in the middle of the sevens, in the middle of the seventh, he will break the covenant. So, after three and a half years, he will break the treaty. He will forbid worship and sacrifices in the temple. He will also mount his image in the holy place in the temple, and he will declare himself as God. And the people will de demand to worship him. At this time, the 666 program will fully be launched. And whoever will not have the mark will not be able to buy or sell or even receive any government essential services. It will be a difficult time to live on earth. Evil will increase in great measures. Such has never been witnessed before. Look at Revelation. <laughs> My friends, look at Revelation. I will read these verses and then we stop eh? because of our time. We'll stop there, I'm sorry. Let me read this verse. Revelation 13, verse 1 to 10, verse 7. The dragon stood on the shore as the sea. I mean the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. With the ten crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power. I want you to note that the dragon gave the beast his power. 
and his throne and great authority. <coughs> Sorry. Verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. <laughs> I need to explain that. Do I? I need to explain that. Now, when we talk of the Antichrist, the Antichrist does not mean that he's against Christ. That's not what that word actually means. It does not mean against Christ. The Antichrist means that he does something like the way Jesus did, but in a falsehood manner. So when, <laughs> when we say that this guy seems like he, has, he had been wounded and healed, actually it means this guy got killed in these many battles. He was killed, but I'm told after three days he resurrected. Anti-Christ. Okay, let me not go deep there. So the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. When he resurrected, the whole world was filled with wonder. How can he die and resurrect? You know, he must be the Messiah, some people would think. You understand? And the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon. The dragon is Satan because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and they asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? You remember when people almost worshipped Herod? And they say, Herod is like a god because he, would, he had an eloquence of speech. That is exactly what is happening with the Antichrist. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Calculate how many days are those? How many years are those? 42 months, how many years are those? Please make a calculation and we realize it is actually falling within our calculation, three and a half years. It opened its mouth to blasphemy God and to slander his name and his dwelling place. And those who lived in heaven, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people, the Israelites, and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation, the people that remains in the world, those that will miss out in the rapture. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those names that have not been written in the Lamb's books of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, Whoever has ear, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword they will be killed. This calls for patience, endurance, and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Wale Itabidi ujifunge kibwewe, ujikaze kimdafu, ufe kisabuni, lakini usimuache yesu. Mambo hayata kuwa rais. Mambo hayata kuwa rais. Sasa nataka ni kwambie, huyu beast ambali onekana kitoka kwenye bahari. Now, in this, in understanding this, the word you see here does not necessarily mean the ocean that we know. But actually it's a multitude of people. So the guy came, he rose among people. He did not just come from the ocean, like a beast coming out of the sea of Anna. He rose among the people. So the Antichrist is actually a person. We will see there's a verse there that says it's actually a person. He will actually rise among the people. You know? And then the final verse that I want us to read is Revelation 13. From verse 11, it says, Then I saw a second beast. Now, there's another beast here. We have already said that beast represent the Antichrist, but there is a second beast here. So who is this one? Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. Now I want you to take note of that. Two horns like a lamb. Now a lamb, Jesus Christ is the lamb of God which was slain. But this is a beast, but it resembles a lamb. It has two horns like actually exactly a lamb. But it is spoke like a dragon. Are you seeing the difference? It looks like a lamp, 
but it speaks like a dragon. Who is this? <laughs> I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf. And it made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Now, the first beast is the Antichrist. But this second beast is causing the entire earth using the power of the dragon to worship so that they can worship the Antichrist. Are you seeing this? The Antichrist whose fatal wound had been healed, you remember? And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Now, because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Imagine people were deceived because of the miracle. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now, I want you to notice, it is actually this second beast that ordered the people to set an image of the Antichrist. All right? Eh? The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak now this is terrible and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed it also forced all people great and small rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast. The mark is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man. That number is 666. Now, let me help you to understand this second beast. This second beast is actually the apostate church. Remember, there is actually a clamor right now to have a one world religion. Pope Francis has actually been pushing. He has been saying that protest is now over, so people need to unite. You have heard of interfaith, you know, churches, coming together with Islam. We have even had Islam. So they are trying to form something, an outfit that will be generally acceptable in the world with one leader. With one leader. For example, somebody like the Pope, I'm sorry, for example, the Pope. You know, the Pope is recognized worldwide. Everywhere he goes, even in the Muslim countries, he's respected badly. So I am imagining something like that. Now, that is the second beast. Now, because it is like a lamp, a lamp, there is religion in it, but it is a sheep. I mean, it is a wolf in sheep clothing. You know, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like the dragon. And he has the ability to perform miracles. And because of those miracles, people will believe him. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we are a miracle ourselves. By virtue that we have believed in Jesus Christ, we are a miracle. We do not need miracles. The world needs miracles, but the church does not need miracles. So don't be influenced by miracles. Some of these miracles are for a lie. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on the other hand, on the other hand, while all these things were happening, he has erected his image now. He's forcing everyone to worship. On the other hand, Israel's eyes will be opened. The nation of Israel, that curse of blindness, that covering of darkness will be lifted. The curse of blindness will be removed. And they will realize that the Antichrist is indeed not the Messiah. 
and many will die by the sword because of their testimony and refusal to worship and take the mark of the beast. That's why the Bible says, those that will die by the sword will die. Those that will be taken to captivity will be taken to captivity. But many of the Jews, they will actually be saved. The Jews will be saved. Now, I want to stop there so that next week we pick it from there now. When the Jews now refuse the mark, what will happen? When the mark of the beast has been fully launched, when the Antichrist is in full operation, performing counterfeit miracles, causing people to worship him. Remember, God is a jealous God. So what will God do? How will he respond to this into the world? Now that's where things get interested. That's where things get interested. Here we have an angry God. Here we have a jealous God. And here is a world infected by bloodthirsty creatures that defy God's name. How will God respond? And what will happen to the people when God responds? God's response will be displayed in two ways. We have what we call bowls, plagues. We have plagues, we have bowls, 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 kama mabasahan, mabowl, mabakuli. And then we have trumpets. Now, we will look at these three things. They are all judgments that will be released on planet Earth. I am telling you to some extent, as something is released and it takes a third of the whole world, maramoja. We will see this thing. The earth will be a terrible place to live, ladies and gentlemen. So, me, I will advise you. I will advise you. You better be among the people that will be raptured. Be among the team that will be raptured. Because if you will remain here, my friend, things will be tough. Things will be tough. Things will be tough. But I know, I know, I will meet you up there. I will meet you up there in the clouds when the trumpet sound. Hallelujah. What a day of rejoicing will be when we all meet Jesus. When we all meet Jesus. Friends, it is possible. It is possible to live a holy life now and save yourself lots of embarrassment tomorrow. I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. Oh, hey, hey. thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, dear God, for speaking to us today. Thank you, dear God. I pray I may not have explained these things exclusively because I am human. I understand in part, but Holy Spirit of God, who knows all things, expound this word to your people. Expound this word, Lord, into our hearts. And this is my prayer, Lord, that we will not just be hearers of God's word. We will not just accumulate information. But Father, we will live in accordance to the word of God. Yes, Lord, even in times of danger, I know the Christian pilgrimage is not a walk in the park. It is a dangerous journey. There are real dangers. There are real woes. There are real casualties on the way. But Father, you have promised in your word that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are there with me. And so I will not fear evil. 
Father, I am praying for your people that boldness will rise within us, O oh dear Lord. Resilience will rise within us, O oh dear God. That we will resist the enemy in our day. We will resist all the temptations of the devil. We will resist all the allurements of the enemy. And we shall overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of Jesus Christ. Jehovah, I pray for your people today. Surround us now with your glory. I pray that we will fall in love with Jesus even more, O oh God. Because soon and very soon, the trumpet will sound. And those that will be lifted will be lifted. And those that will remain, indeed shall remain. But how I pray, dear God, that we will take part in the first resurrection. We will take part. Those who will be asleep will take part in the first resurrection. And then we will meet with Jesus in the air. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your word. I am praying for someone, dear God, that has been living a double life. Father, I pray for them today that they will repent, even as the revelation tells us. Repent. Repent. This is the time for repentance. For a time is coming that there will be no chance to repent. But as long as it is called it today, we can repent. So Lord, I pray that the church will get ready. The bride will get ready. We will get ready. We will do our part. We will work as long as it is day, oh God. Father, I pray that we hold each other accountable. We will hold each other accountable in this journey so that we make it. For the Bible says two are better than one. So I pray, Lord, that our relationships in this church will grow even tight and strong, my Father. That we will support one another to see that we are in the journey, oh God. To see that no one falls away, oh God. Thank you, thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayer today. And now I, I release a blessing upon your people. Bless them, dear God, even as they continue to wait upon you, as they continue to look unto you. Meet each one of them at the point of their need. Heal the sick, oh God. Feed the hungry, my Father. Shelter the homeless, oh God, so that your name may be glorified and be exalted. I pray for businesses and careers, Lord, of your people, that in, in spite of the lockdown, they will still thrive in Jesus' name. We bless you. We love you. And we honor you. Thank you for our children as they continue to prepare for their studies and all those, the candidates, Lord, as they prepare, Father, grant them wisdom and counsel. Give them understanding, sharpness of mind with an excellent spirit that they may be able to excel, even for the glory and honor of your blessed name. We love you, Jesus, and we honor you today. For it is in Jesus' name we have prayed and believe. Amen.